to be all right. Yeah. Well, that's ain't gonna hurt the collarbone. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to show you something. That's an old car, you know, and cars are hard to get. We're in Halifax, Nova Scotia. People, like everywhere, they're holding on to their cars. And this car here is, although it may look solid on the outside, I'm just leaning on the door. But if you give it a good shake, that's the frame. These are a, it's a, a hard top convertible, and the frame starts from the bottom up. So, But it's on this side, so it should be safe. But the car is not going to stay together. It's definitely going to fall apart. We can almost guarantee that, because it's rusted out. But it doesn't run that bad. It doesn't run that good, neither. Really, eh? Wish I had another car, but unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to go with this situation. So I don't antici I anticipate a good jump, but I don't. It'd be a record. It'd be a miracle, you know. Ken Carter jumps cars for a living, and people like to see him do it. They come for the thrill of watching a man risk his life, watching a man fly a car and crash it at 50 miles an hour. Ken Carter's been doing that for 20 years. Three times a week. Tonight, Ken flew a 64 Chevy 125 feet and smashed up his ankle. At 37, he knows he can't keep jumping forever. But Ken has a dream. Before he's finally through, Ken Carter wants to amaze the world. Ken's dream starts here, on a street in Montreal. He has put all his money, $30,000, into this car. It's no ordinary car. It's a jet car with 7,500 pounds of thrust. World record auto jumps are measured in feet. 125, 140, even 180 feet. But Ken Carter wants to jump much further. He wants to jump a car a mile. It changed all that much, you know. I don't think it ever will. We used to play, come out and chase whatever we could chase. Rats, cats, everything. When the snow was high, we used to jump off the top of the, uh, was a shed. You'd store stuff in there. For the life of me, even then, this portion of this yard was always blocked off. We could never get up on top of this roof and play, and if you did, it was a no-no. And I guess why well, I, I used to think that maybe this is where the rich people lived. You know, used to pile orange crates over here and just get up there. Maybe it was because it was boarded and you, and you weren't allowed up there. It's because we really wanted to go. I'm a healthy specimen, and this is where I came from. There's nothing the matter with this place. And you know, and this is how I feel about it. You know, and I get somebody asked me about what about your what about your childhood? What about it? You know, what about the skinny, skinny cross-eyed, bow-legged kid that used to play in his backyard? And now I'm sitting on the threshold of life.
cold. You know, just everything is green and you're frozen. And you just feel like you're waiting to go wherever you're going, hell or heaven. You know, that's what it feels like to me. I mean, you know. But I got upside down in a car one time, jumping, ran out of gas on the ramp and got hemmed in the car. And I could smell the gas. The car was upside down, the wheels were off of it, and people were trying to get me out of a, out of a hole the size of a 50-cent piece. And one guy was hollering, let's get the torches and cut a hole in the car. And meanwhile, I was hanging in there and just waiting for that first spark to light up the car. And it would have just, there was no way that I, you know, I couldn't have put it out. I can't really think of any other one other than broken ankles, kneecaps, smashed chests when that steering in, in Kakana, Wisconsin, up there at Green Bay. It, uh, when the steering wheel punched me in the chest, that was another close one because, you know, you always think in terms of the front of your body as your mechanism, you know, like the heart, and the rib cage. You know, it's just like the business, you know, like 15 years ago, I remember guys going over the Niagara Falls in a wheelbarrow. Who wants to do that? I mean, you really, you know, I'd go and see that. You know, but then the moment somebody got dead, I think I'd never go back. Ken jumped over eight, ten, a dozen cars. He jumped chuck wagons, cement trucks, and he got hurt. He was getting older, his bones were more brittle, and they took longer to mend. But today, Ken Carter's still on the road. Albuquerque, New Mexico, Tulsa, Oklahoma, off Alabama, North Bay, Ontario, 50,000 miles a season. It's a tough life, but Ken likes it, and he makes good money. Ken has reached the stage where he could afford to take a back seat, strictly promote and manage the up-and-coming young Ken Carters, men like Tom Berry, who with just seven jumps under his belt, is new to the game is new to that special excitement of being a daredevil. Appreciate a nice round of applause as he gets it right on. Yeah, I don't blame you there. Tom Berry. <laughs> Why do you like jumping? Why? Uh, psychiatrists have all sorts of theories and reasons and whatnot. They say any, everything from people having masculinity complexes to suicidal tendencies. And I really don't think it's any of those. Uh, there's a thrill involved. Uh, definite thrill you get out of it. It's a kind of a psychic ec ecstasy that uh, comes from that uh, shot of adrenaline you get when you're pushing yourself to the limits of mental and physical endurance. I was told a long time ago by my mother of all people, she said if life is boring, risk it. Site. 50 acres of land have already been cleared for the huge crowd expected. Now they're working on the ramp. When finished, it will have a 1,400 foot runway and climb to a height of 85 feet. In Chicago, Dick Keller supervises the construction of the car. He designed the Blue Flame, which at over 640 miles an hour broke the world land speed record in 1970. This car he's building for Ken is a rocket car capable of 11,000 pounds of thrust, capable of flying a mile. The cost, over $100,000. Everyone's working overtime to get the car finished. Three weeks to go. It's been raining on and off in Morrisburg, and ABC is starting to worry. They send Evil Knievel, the world's most famous daredevil, to check on Ken's progress. <clears throat> kind of reminds me of the canyon. One. Oh, come on! Okay. 
stay, Eagle, stay with the bird, stay with the bird. Had a premature shoot. You have a good shoot on you. You got no elevation, you got no room for air. If you come down in that water, you better have somebody to get you out, get you out in a hurry. Okay. Slowly going down. It has cleared just cleared, cleared the rocks, the rocks. thank God. It looks like he is in the water. I worked on my own project at the Snake River Canyon for nearly three years. They're trying to finish everything up here in just two weeks. The weather has been bad, the runway is muddy, the takeoff ramp is not built. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. I think it's much more dangerous than the Snake River Canyon stunt, and I think that the time and preparation that's been put into it is much too little. This is maybe a daredevil stunt that might end all daredevil stunts. As I said in the interviews, and I also said in my publicity for the and I've been saying it for years, I still believe that Evil Knievel is the second best deer devil in the world. And uh, I say that because I feel that I'm number one. Uh, for the purpose of training Ken Carter to drive a rocket vehicle to prepare him for his jump. How long do you think it'll take him to learn how to drive this car? That depends on Ken. We hope to wrap it up in six, six runs. Six runs? Six passes down the track. We hope to have him going close to 250. What's the top speed that you've ever driven it at? The fastest I've ever run is 242. 242. And what's that feel like? Uh, it's pretty fast. The most exciting part is trying to get it stopped, I think, especially when the chute fails. <laughs> and the first time I ran 240, the chute failed. Do you know anything about uh, what Ken's uh, wants to do? Well, to my understanding, he's supposed to be jumping Niagara Falls or someplace on the St. Lawrence <laughs> River for a distance of a little over a half a mile in a rocket-powered vehicle. And what do you think of that whole thing? <laughs> I kind of wish I had asked that question. Do you have a safety suit or anything? No, I don't have anything at all. As a matter of fact, even my helmet uh, is in Toronto being uh, suited for... Mm -hmm. uh, Keller wanted to go up there and being suited for uh, communications. So I don't have any, anything. I'll have to... I'll tell you. It's going to be tight. It's going to be tight. Mine's comfortable on me, but uh, tight around the waist. It is? What, what's your waist? Uh, about 32. Oh, hell, man, I'm a 36. Well, oh. the only thing we can do is give it a try. Right. You know, and, and try it if I have to. Right. I'll just squeeze into it. You really somehow. don't need one. Okay, Bob. Here, Here, let me go. Oh, what? Huh? What's up? This car is Lou's whole life. Usually, he never lets anyone else drive it. He's made a special exception for Ken. But right now, it doesn't seem such a good idea. Captain America was custom built to fit his 160 pound frame. Ken Carter's six foot tall and weighs 200. Tight, huh? Take the suit off. You have to get the suit off. Right. When I sit in my shoulders, sit underneath those, those head pieces, see? Ah. Whoa, geez, here get, we go. Get me my, uh... Jeans? Yes, please. Okay, that's it. Try to get, stand down here, then get in, and then pick my feet up. Can you get your shoulders underneath there? That's, That's it. Right. Now you're in there. Okay. How do you feel? Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got your walkie talkie. Can you see my finger? No. Can you see my hand? Yeah. No. Huh? No. Yeah. Well, that's three inches above the hood. You can see way, way in front of you. Okay. okay. When you're ready, bash it on the wood. Make sure it's all the way down.
That's the fastest I've ever been all my life. Is that right? <laughs> well, well, we're gonna go faster yet. Oh, oh, oh. But, uh, what a nice ride. Beautiful. Straight, huh? No, I've got a little, uh, I have to bring it back. Really? Yeah, it's got a little bit of weight, huh? I'll tell you what, hey, don't worry ever about me going racing. <laughs> Do they ever have to worry about that, Lou? One week before the jump, Ken Carter is ready. His top speed, 255 miles an hour. He probably ran uh, right close to 260 miles an hour, which is faster than I've ever run in my own car. Yeah. But that's what we were here for, to uh, teach the man to go fast. Yeah. Is his car going to go any faster than that? Yeah, from what I understand, he's supposed to leave the ramp somewhere around 270, 280 miles an hour, which is booking it down the road. Yeah. Now that Ken has driven your car, how do you feel about it? Much better than I did when I first got here. Like I told you in the beginning, I didn't know the man when I showed up, and but I have confidence in my car and, and, and what he's into. You think he can pull it off? Like I said, man can do anything he's determined enough to. You know, you have to take off, bite off a hunk and fight it till you conquer it. Called of some car testing that there are two or three unknown factors which require further testing. And as a result, it has made both the engineer, Richard Keller, and Mr. Keating, nervous to the degree that if they go ahead with the jump at this point in time, that the result could be fatal. Uh, I know Ken is deeply disappointed. He was dialed in to, as he says, he was dialed in to do it. Ken and has done everything he could to get himself ready, but the ramp and car problems are beyond his control. Too many things are stacked up against him, and for the first time, he feels his dream, the mile-long jump, is slipping away. Thank you, Sid. <clears throat> you know, uh, I find it difficult, probably for the first time in my life, to be able to stand here and uh, talk to you, gentlemen of the press, ladies, because I, I tell you now that I know that uh, the jump, in almost any one of my jumps, record jumps, whether it be Islip, New York, or Houston Astrodome, is dangerous. And I know for a fact that Morrisburg could have probably been more dangerous than any one of them. But that's a, a fact of my life. And I went out this weekend and got into a rocket-powered car called Captain America and ran and set a Canadian track record of 255 mile per hour in six seconds. If you think that ain't a rush for a stranger, I got some news for you. And I've done all of this. I went up in an airplane with Jim Parker and pulled four Gs for three and a half seconds and got sick to my stomach, and I'm sick now. I'm 38 years old, and I can't, even my jumps of the past few years haven't been up to par, and I know that I'm getting a little old for this business. I'm dialed into September 25th, you know, that to me is a very important date. I, you know, there's a lot of people out there that say, why, you know, why does anybody do anything? I mean, you know, what the hell am I gonna do? Go out and pump gas in a gasoline station and I jump cars and, uh, you know, I'm just coming to the end of my rope and I just can't go out and do the things I used to do 10 years ago and neither can any one of us in this room. This year they're taking no chances. They have a highly qualified civil engineer on site seven days a week. Do you think that they could have finished this thing last year? First of all, they had to reach a height of 80, 85.2 feet and right now they're around 60 feet. So they had to go high, you know, another 25 foot high. Do you think it would have been possible in the four days that they had left? <laughs> well, I guess, no way. <laughs> Plain and simple. You think you're going to be finished on time? Oh, yeah. yes, definitely. When, is, when's you going to be, when are you going to be finished? Well, uh, well, OK, <laughs> one of the main of the problem is the rain. Mm -hmm. if, if it's going to continue to rain from now till the 25th, then we probably will run into troubles, but um, hopefully it won't. The car has been brought up to Montreal. It's all but finished. Tom Daniels and Dave Jaramba have come up from Chicago to fit on the last pieces of the chassis. The ailerons. After that, the only thing left will be the testing of the fuel tanks. 
Uh, what are the ailerons for, anyway? What are they going to do? Uh, on any roll, absolutely, if the car were to... If it, when it's off the ramp, if it should go left or right... Yeah. Just to bring it can, back to with level. With the steering wheel, he can bring it back to level. Yeah. And then he'll set it right down on the four wheels. Is this car going to run? No doubt about it. Absolutely. Yeah. It will make it. Yeah. What's that? It will make it to its destination. Yeah? Yeah. But then, the operation hits a small snag. When Tom and Dave tested the fuel tank, it exploded and blew the front end off the car. But Tom and Dave are used to problems like this. That's why the tank was tested, to find out if the welds would hold. Dick Keller got on the phone to locate material for a new tank. In no time at all, they are back on the track. How is this tank going to survive any better than the last tank? All right, the test tank uh, uh, was built some, a, a, a little bit lighter than, than this tank uh, because uh, it wouldn't have to withstand the impact of the jump. You know? yeah. uh, so after reconsidering going to the bladder system, we went to a heavier wall tank also. Meanwhile, at the jump site, they are lowering the final section of the ramp. But somewhere there has been a slight miscalculation. It doesn't quite fit. For the first time, the site engineer isn't talking. Idiot. Leave me alone right now, please. Why there's a problem? Well, they made a mistake in the elevation on one of the footings. Uh -huh. I think it's, it looks like the back footing is one foot too high. One foot too high. Yeah, now they, they haven't made up their mind yet what they're going to do. Either they're going to cut the steel or chip the footing. Chip the footing. That's what we're waiting for now. Yesterday you said that this tank would absolutely not bust. Now what happened? Yeah, I did say that. And, uh, uh, I was only, I only brought that up from experience. The guy's built a hundred tanks for us and we've never had a failure, you know. And uh, here we are. And what happened? Well, tell me what happened with this tank. Well, lack of penetration in the wells again. And uh, when we brought the tank up to 850, 900 pounds of pressure per square, or 900 pounds per square inch pressure, it popped open. It's like a water rocket. How do you feel about this project now after What's happened? I mean, what's my, my personal feelings are that there's somebody trying to tell us something. I don't know, you know. This, this, everything has really gone sour, <laughs> truthfully. Yeah, we, I didn't expect you to come up here and put it together and uh, everything to go right. I didn't expect anything like this. Our experience has been, you know, 12 to 1,400 cars without a failure of any kind. You know, and here we look like a couple of dummies. But you guys should be able to get it done by this weekend, I guess. Sure. Test. We will. So you found another tank? No, we have located the material and it's being rolled uh, today and should be in the, in the area by tonight. And this yeah. time we're going to put it together ourselves. Right, right. There's we, only one way to get the job done right and that's to do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. And they did, and it blew up too. This time Tom and Dave offered no explanation. They gave up and went back to Chicago, leaving the car without a fuel tank. Once again, the jump was canceled. The jump's been rescheduled for next July. The car has been brought down to Florida, complete with brand new fuel tank. At last, it's ready for its first test run. Everyone's here, except Ken. He's with Kennedy and the backers. Costs are escalating, and the backers demand Ken put his money on the line. They'll all spend the rest of the day locked in a motel room, fighting it out. That's out of the perimeter. That'll be okay, Tom. But the testing is in good hands. Crew chief and test driver is slamming Sammy Miller. He has his own rocket car and the world record for the quarter mile. For the very first run, Sammy will try to hit 270 miles an hour. With the enormous thrust of the rocket engine, it won't take long to reach that speed. Slightly less than five seconds. But up to now, the car has never moved an inch under its own power, and nobody is really sure it ever will. They've lost three tanks already in testing, and there's no guarantee this one won't go the same way. 
and blow the car to pieces. Next day, more tests. The car is complete with body and wings, and for this run, it's set to do 250. About the speed it was going when it went out of control in Florida. Nobody tells Ken he'll be going that fast. Sammy doesn't want to worry him. Ken's in for quite a jolt. Well, Ken, how'd it feel? Just like you said it was going to run. Yeah, super, huh? Now, what do you got to ask? What's that? Oh, that's just a little fuel. It just goes away. I wanted to tell you something. I, uh... No, no, no. Don't tell me. I already know. I lied to you. Yeah, I know. I know you did. Um, but the chute came out, and I started to get a little... How much did you lie? <laughs> you were over 250. Uh, ride was good. Yeah. It was good. I had to do that. No, that's all right. Uh, it's okay. Um, uh, it's in your hands, you know. I mean, uh, you're yeah, the well, see, you I figured did... I could handle it, otherwise you wouldn't yeah. give it to me, you know. How fast was but she was nice. She was really nice. Uh, I, told, was I told Ken he was going to be around 215, 220, maybe 230, depending if we run out of fuel. The, uh, one of the reasons I did that was uh, we're at a deadline right now. Ken's got a jump he's got to do. I know the car will work fine. I know Ken trusts me, but that was a... Uh, I took a shot on Ken's ability, and I, it paid off. Ken is capable, very capable, and... Uh, Mm. Congratulations. Thank you, Sammy. Pass. <laughs> Thank you. Ken's on his way to the big jump at last. It's ready. Are you ready? The car is brought to Morrisburg for the very last tests. The ramp is supposed to be completely finished. But today, Ken learns that isn't quite true. Now what do I do with this? The surface is slightly bumpy. Sammy says it's nothing serious, but Sammy has lied to Ken before. Test run could hardly be called a complete success. But Sammy's under pressure from the backers to get things moving. Their money is running out. And yet, we had a press conference here, fired that car on the ramp, and there was nobody here. I mean, if something's wrong. I hold a press conference in Los Angeles, and it hits the front pages all over the world. We hold a press conference in Morrisburg, and nobody shows up. What the hell am I doing? I'm fixing to to get in this car and who knows, get dead for it. For all I know, I could be dead at the end of that ramp. That car can never get off the ramp and I could be dead. We're talking about something that's going to happen. Yet I'm sitting out here with, with, with nothing. I got a budget here. I need 50 grand to finish it. And I'm telling you now that I'm staying here until it's done and the press is gonna pick this thing up and that test run with that car up to the edge of the ramp which shoots open before I go. It'll be on the front page of the Montreal Star before I leave. And it should be. Holy Christ, man, what are we doing? We're jumping a mile in a rocket car. It's never been done, and it never will be done ever again. I'm looking for a world record. I'm looking for the ultimate statement, Ken Carter, yeah. world's greatest daredevil. Really, that's what it's about. This isn't the way the wind's supposed to be blowing, is it? No, they plan on it. Yeah, he always, they, they always figured it'd be blowing this way. It's well, going with us right now. There. Well, she's blowing that way, isn't it? She's blowing like this now. Yeah. yeah. Usually like blows that. like this. I'm not afraid of the jump because I've done too many. And this is just another jump. I know it's longer and it's higher and it's faster. But it's just another jump. Kenneth Gordon Polish Jack came in and rented the property off of Wilfred Zurn for a challenge for a guy by the name of Ken Carter. And I've accepted it. And I've got all the engineers and all the people with me. So it's right. The weather's beautiful. The timing is right. For those that don't understand, the cart ahead of the horse in four years, they should know by now. Rome was not built in one day, and yeah. this is it. I would figure that he probably just missed the island a little bit with the, if he gets a good high deployment of uh, canopies. Because he will have some sort of drift factor, which will make it nice for the car. The car is prepared to float. So 
It's just a matter of where the wind's going to take him. Looking good. It's 2 o'clock. The jump is to go at 4. The finishing touches are made to the ramp. The safety experts check the parachutes. And, oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? A million dollars. It's a big dream, Bob. You were, you've been here since the beginning, haven't you? Yeah. When you think of all the broken bones, right up until just a few months ago on July 31st in Edmonton. Twelve chuck wagons, wow. Today's event is so big that the Seaway authorities have agreed to hold up shipping until 5 o'clock. They've even slowed the current in the river, so that if Ken doesn't make it to the island, the rescue will be easier. Jim Deist and Dar Robinson finish packing the parachutes. It's 3 o'clock, time to fuel the car. But the rest of the crew refuse to work. They suddenly decide they haven't been paid enough money and demand another $27,000 in cash. Finally, at 5 o'clock, the money arrives. The car is fueled, and Sammy makes the last test run. The car is fine. Everything's ready. All right, all right, all right. The man's here. <laughs> Ken pumps himself up, getting the adrenaline going. The boredom of the afternoon is gone. The delay, forgotten. Only one thing matters now. After five long years, Ken Carter is going to jump. On the line. One last rehearsal of the blast off sequence. Countdown. Three, two, one, zero. Hit. Right pedal. Red marker behind your shoulder. Left pedal. Yeah. Take the big motor off. Off the end of the ramp. Run out of the The rescue boats are ready and in position. Everything is set. As far as your steering goes, you look out the window. And you'll, once you're airborne, you kind of like cruising an airplane. Yeah. Ken climbs into the car. The seaway has been reopened and ships are coming through at three minute intervals, but that's not going to stop them. News of the jump has leaked. The roads around are blocked with traffic. Police are worried about safety, but that's not going to stop them. Tomorrow morning, whenever you guys feel comfortable, get a good night's sleep, a good whatever you want in the morning. Rest. It's gonna be hard to rest. What was it? What was? What was it? I hollered at you. You were standing here. What the hell was that leak? It was a self vent. Sammy. From the outside. Sammy. Jeez. I only opened it from the inside. I nearly had a heart attack. Okay, you're cool though. I nearly had a heart attack. I, yeah, you could, I could hear you. Right up there. Where were you? Right huh. there. <laughs> 
three, two, one, go. One, two, three. It took a week to get everything reorganized, but on October 3rd, Ken's back at the ramp. Nine seconds. Abort. Today, the weather's not good. It looks like rain. But the Hollywood backers are desperate. Their money's running out. Every time they bring their 20-man film crew to the site, it costs them $25,000. To save money, the ground crew's been cut to the absolute minimum. One, go. Two, go. Three, go. Four, go. Abort. Oh, okay. All right. But I'm listening for abort. The rescue operation has been whittled down from a barge with a crane, two high-powered speedboats, and six frogmen to two guys in a rubber boat. Last time, there were eight firemen here with a fire engine and a 500-gallon pumper. Today, there's one kid, a tow truck, and a 25-gallon water can. And the kid's getting pretty bored. Fifteen minutes later, Ken's strapped in the driver's seat. But nothing's happening. Okay, now, Vern, underneath his armpits, there should be... The helicopter is in position. Everyone's waiting for the countdown. Ken's still busy adjusting the safety harness, checking and rechecking the walkie-talkies. Just keep talking. Everyone else just waits and waits. Forty-five minutes go by, and then it rains. The crew try to dry the track with the helicopter, but that doesn't work. So. The meetings begin. Hollywood meetings, driver meetings, camera meetings, and very heavy meetings. They don't stop the rain, but they do make some plans. After half an hour of steady rain, the jump is canceled once again. I got to say to the lovely people in New York, I hope nobody's having breakfast there at the kitchen table because if I come in on the roof, it ain't going to bother me. It's wide open and go. I always like the state of New York, so I'm sure I hope they like me when I get there. You gonna take a walk? Today, there are even fewer people at the jump site. Like the cameras are rolling on Kenny Powers. There's no sign of Ken Carter. Ken Carter is in Ottawa, just an hour away from the site. It's raining here, and it always rains in Morrisburg. So to him, it looks like there'll be no chance for a jump today. Ken's with Hugh Kennedy and the backers, talking about the future, dreaming of a European tour and a trip to Japan. Everyone's happy to let Ken talk. I think at this point, we get Meanwhile, at Morrisburg, the cameras are still focused on powers. Todd, Todd, let's go, come on. During the night, the backers made a decision. They think that Carter's lost his nerve and they're afraid he'll never jump. So. They decided to pull him out of the car and get Powers to jump in his place. Powers gives the official reason for the switch. Well, Bob, you know how Ken's bones are. They've been broken a lot. His left wrist was broken into Houston Astrodome in January. We went ahead about In the summer there, he did a ramp to ramp. In Edmonton, over the 12 chuck wagons, he hit awful hard. He broke it again. He took the cast off himself. And if, so, if everything don't function, you're in a world of trouble. Yeah. I'm praying and hoping that I can make everything function yeah. and give it the best shot that I got. Yeah. In fact, we'll know in about 15 minutes. The countdown is too long. I think it was too long. It's, you, get, you, you get to thinking about it, looking at it, forget that. I know I'm going off of it. I don't have to sit there for two or five minutes and think about it. Ten second countdown. Yeah. That's all I need. If I'm not ready in ten seconds, I'll never be ready. Yeah. The only way I want to hear shoots if I get sideways, upside down, or backwards, let me go as long as I'm going. Right. Give me shoots yeah. as a last resort. Yeah. I want that island. To be truthful with you, I want off the end of the ramp. Yeah. But I want that island too. Yeah. So it's a joint, joint thing. And I'm going to give it hell. Yeah. Kenny Powers has been working for Ken Carter as a stunt driver for 10 years. He's jumped more than 200 times and broken his back twice. Now he has to wear a special brace when he jumps. But today he's forgotten it, and he's going to jump without it. Everyone's in a hurry. They're all worried that Ken Carter will find out what's happening. If he does, they know he'll come storming down to stop the jump. But for the backers, it's now or never.
they finally run out of money. All right, guys, my advice is to get off the ramp. You don't want no tire tracks on you. Today is the last day. All right, the lights are green, and let's get ready and go. Hey, Kenny, it's Mark. Okay. Somebody up on top of the ramp. All right, somebody get them down. We're getting ready to perk here and go. I want to go. Okay, we're coming up the river now, and the boat, we see you. You're going up there. The dock is about 200 feet. Uh, yeah, Kenny, here's Jim. You want to say hello to Jim? 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 All right, is the doctor there? Roger, we got a paramedic. All right, it's go, the light's green, let's get it on. I'm going to get the motors perked right now. I'm ready to go. We are in position. We are ready. The helicopter's in position. Every time I do a jump, Bob, I always say a little prayer. Yeah. I've already said one. I'll say another one right now. Hope God's with me. There's no waiting today. It's a race against time. The rain is moving closer, and Ken Carter could arrive any second. Uh, somebody go to the motor home. Give me the phone rough. I'm telling him he's perking the engines now. They're being perked right now, guys. Five minutes, if that, to go. There's less than five minutes to go. Kenny's young wife, Donna, stays close to him. At three this morning, he recorded a tape for her to play, in case he's killed. See that chopper up there? I hope I make him look like he's sitting on the ground. Yeah. That's what we need. Well, we're looking for 300 and about nine feet, something like that. They'd better be, because Kenny is ready to do it. It doesn't matter to him how small the crowd is. Go! Let's go do it! Do it! Now! Let's go! Radio test. Okay, a one, two, Thank you, he's got it. Dave? All right, I'm ready. Okay, he's ready, so let's forget it. No long countdown today. The rescue boat is ready. The chopper is ready. The crowd is ready. But most of all, the driver, Kenny Powers, is ready. Uh, the car did not perform like it should have off the end. 
everybody's, he, Kenny's okay there. They got him on the ground over here laying down. There's some, something minor here. Uh, Gary Simpson is oh, waiting over to... to <laughs> Kenny Power's problems started on the ramp. The bumps which had worried Carter made the car bounce, cracking the fiberglass body. Powers was thrown around inside the cockpit and he couldn't keep his foot on the pedal. As a result, the car which was supposed to leave the ramp at 270 miles an hour was only going 180. There was not enough thrust to make the trip. The wind caught the car, ripping off parts of the cracked bodywork causing the parachutes to deploy ahead of schedule. This was fortunate. They saved Kenny Power's life. Oh. You're ready to go. Oh. Powers has broken eight vertebrae. He has three cracked ribs and a fractured wrist. In his nine second flight, Kenny Powers flew a distance of only 506 feet. And why you weren't there? Um, you started off with the Charlie Fisher this morning? No, there was supposed to be a meeting last night. And I didn't want to meet last night. I wanted to spend some time with the crew because we knew bad weather was coming. You know, I wanted to spend some time with the guys. So we did. We had dinner. And I made arrangements to meet with Hugh Kennedy and Charlie Fisher this morning at 8.30. We met. We discussed the possibility of the European tour. And we got into the fact that the people in Europe didn't want me to get hurt, and they didn't want me going over there in a wheelchair. And right then, I got the idea of what they were saying. What they were saying was they wanted somebody else to jump that ramp. Yeah. Did they ask you about that? Did they ask you about Ken Powers? Oh, yeah. They no, they never mentioned Ken Powers. They mentioned the fact that they wanted to uh, they wanted to uh, have somebody else jump. And then I mentioned. I said, "Are you talking about Kenny Powers?" Yeah. And they said, "Yes." I said, "I said to him, he's not qualified." He's not qualified to jump. He's a good stuntman, but he's never been over 100 mile an hour, and he's never been in that car at 260 mile an hour. You think that was dangerous for them to do that? Yes, definitely. It was wrong. It was definitely wrong. I'm not going to sit here and say to you that what happened to Kenny Powers would not have happened to me. After five years and over one million dollars, this is the end of the greatest daredevil stunt of all time. Everyone is certain of that. Everyone except one man, Ken Carter. This is my dream. This is the end of my dream. I don't care if I never jump again, but this I'm going to do. This is my dream. I created it. I built it, I designed it. Nobody ever jumped a car a mile. That's what I'm gonna do. That's what I want to do. And that's what I'm gonna do. The thing about it is it's, a, it's, it's something that you only dream about. What can I do, jump 18, 19 cars, 20 cars, go out there and bust more bones? You're right, I'm getting too old, but not old enough to do this. One. I'll do this one. I won't retire. We can travel around and let the kids, I'll teach the children like the Eagles said, but I'll teach them because they believe in me. This is next. It's the final. It's the ultimate thing. What can you do with a car other than this? No, no. It's my dream.
soaking wet and apparently undaunted, Carter took full responsibility for the fail jump. It's a driver error. Has nothing to do with my crew. It was me behind the wheel. I was the one that pulled it to the left and pulled it to the right. And then even before checking with Westgate Speedway owner Art Robinson, he made an announcement. We'll be back Labor Day weekend, and I'm going to get this car across this pond. I swear to you, I will. stunt driver Ken Carter was killed early today trying to beat his own world record. We have this report from James Careless of our affiliate CHEX in Peterborough, Ontario. Carter's friends say he was particularly worried about last night's jump, but they say he was desperate to regain the publicity he'd been losing for the past few years. Ken was a little different with this run. He asked me to do a couple things for him before he got into the car and uh, what kind of things he asked me to make sure that Larry Flickinger had been taken care of <laughs> I've just completed a world record car jump and I feel good about that my next jump an airplane, or possibly a blimp. We're working on that right now. The culmination of my career, a mile in a rocket car from Morrisburg, Ontario, Canada to somewhere near Ogden Island, New York. See you there.